Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey, Tyler. Tyler. Tribe Call Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've got two singer-songwriters who both come from the tradition of socially conscious folk punk. In fact, one of them you could credit with inventing the genre. The other may be its most popular current proponent. Billy Bragg and Frank Turner. Now, Billy Bragg is a legendary British performer who came up just after the punk boom of the late 1970s and channeled that energy into the style of a solo troubadour. His early records were massively influential to all sorts of musicians, which is no surprise given their wit, their lyrical pointedness, and how beautifully they capture the spirit of youthful engagement. But that was 40 years ago, and Bragg has created an incredible body of work since that's always expanding, but never losing that kernel of truth. It got really easy to catch up with the whole thing recently, as he released a massive 14-CD box set called The Roaring 40, which you'll hear a little bit about in this chat. Bragg also has some U.S. dates lined up for this July. Check out a little bit of a classic brag track right here, one that today's other guest references in this chat. This is Tank Park Salute. Tree taps on a window pane That feeling smothers me again That is it true that we all have to die As I said, Frank Turner mentions that song as well as some other brag classics in this chat. He's clearly a big fan. Turner's been doing it for two decades now, and he's an absolute road warrior. Next year will mark his three thousandth gig, a big number recently aided by a world record he set in which he played 15 shows in different cities in the span of 24 hours. True to his ethic, this wasn't a publicity stunt, but rather a way to support one of the many causes he believes in, in this case, the Music Venue Trust. Those shows came hot on the heels of Turner's 10th album, Undefeated, in which he reckons a bit with getting older, but remaining true to himself and the things he believes in. That feeling is perfectly encapsulated in this relatively chill track, Ceasefire. Check it out. 15-year-old Francis we need to have a word I know cause I remember That you cannot stand the birth But Richard Ashcroft had a point Now I'm old enough to see In this great chat, Bragg and Turner talk about everything from Bragg's first U.S. tour to their moments of musical awakening. Turner hilariously talks about his inner 15-year-old giving him shit for being successful, as well as an old punk mentor who came to see him at Wembley Arena. They talk about how activism and understanding change over the years, and how one of Bragg's biggest songs, Sexuality, has morphed in this age of trans visibility. And they talk about music, especially live music, as a chance for communion, which I think is something most Talkhouse listeners can relate to. Enjoy. Um, how are you, Bill? I'm good, and you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. I'm in Madrid. I'm on tour with NoFX at the moment, uh, doing oh. their farewell tour. It's a nice way to start an album cycle because we only have to play for half an hour. I love those shows. Yeah, I love those. I did. I did the um, Arboretums with Paul Heaton a couple of years ago. Oh yeah, and um, that was just brilliant. It was in the middle of uh, a World Cup, and also most of the time we were home before the end of the game. It's nice to not have to hold the entire gig up, isn't it? Well, and, you and ticket sales aren't your problem, that kind of thing. I'm sure you remember, I'm not a football man, but we had a thing, Matt, who plays keys in my band, who you've met over the years, he, he's a Watford man. And we were playing a show somewhere in America, and he asked if we could move sound check forward so that he could watch the game because it was falling when we usually sound check. And so we did that for him. And then basically, it was a historic loss for Watford. They were utterly humiliated somewhere. I think at Wembley. Yeah, it'll be trying to get into, back into the premiership. Yes, and I made the error of um, making a joke about this on stage during the actual gig, and uh, Matt didn't take it well at all. <laughs> For him, it's hard. I had the absolute nightmare of being on stage at Cambridge Folk Festival during the Women's European Cup final. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Where the entire audience were sort of half what you mean, half watching their phones. I like to try and imagine that I can control the the mood of the audience, you know? Whatever mood they're in at a festival, I can lift it up. That's what I like to try and do. But the, bit, the idea of having an audience whose mood could change catastrophically in, while I was on <laughs> Depending on the result. Yeah. 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 But my real nightmare was that it was going to go to penalties because during a penalty shootout, you know, I'm going to be on stage. I'm going to be the only person who doesn't know if the audience is <laughs> gri gripping their head in horror. If yeah, yeah, sure. They've scored or we've missed. You know, it's like I literally, and it's funny this point because I never get worried about gigs. I get excited. Sure. And I get fired up, you know, but I never lie the night before the show thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do? 
because I couldn't look at the people watching their phones. So I look at the back of the auditorium, which it was a long, it was a long white marquee, you know, yeah, yeah, with the open back. Because I found over the years that best not to look in the front row. If you look under the balcony, there's usually an exit sign in the theatre, and if you sing to that, everybody gets a bit. <laughs> that's what that's my old trick about playing solo. Anyway, yeah, yeah. So I thought I'll just look out the back of the tent. There was the world's biggest England flag slowly going backwards. <laughs> and the back. It was a bloody nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And in the end, you may not know this, but we won in the end. So well, in the middle of greetings to the new brunette, that place just went mad. Beer went up everywhere. People were screaming. I stopped playing and started crying. That moment you suddenly think, maybe the bridge to this song was better than I thought it was. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Trust me, it was the, it was the book. I didn't know what to do with the audience at this point. So I got the audience to sing Jerusalem, then I fucked off. I thought, that's it, I can't. I don't know I don't know if I've done a good, great gig here or a dreadful gig. But in the end, everyone seemed to be pleased that they were with a load of other people when it happened. Well, it's a unifying moment. And I think that's yeah. the thing. When I was a kid, I used to hate sport conceptually. I, I got into fights with football people when I was a kid and all the rest. And it wasn't for me. But I think there's that AC Grayling thing where I, I, I respect AC Grayling, but he was sort of writing about how sort of atheist people could do with some sort of communal gathering thing. And he was suggesting sort of atheist meeting houses that were essentially churches and all this kind of thing. And I read that book and I thought, this is a man who's never been to a good gig. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Or like, a football you, match. Or a football match. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I was going to say, by the way, about getting nervous. So people always ask, like, do you get nervous before shows and all the rest of it? It's not nerves. It's excitement. It's a different thing. But the times when I do get nervous before a show are the moments when I don't know what's coming, right? And at a normal gig that you or I do, and we've done a few in our time, you've got a broad sense of what's coming. So it's not really nerves, right? You know roughly yeah. how an audience is going to be. The most nerve-wracking show that I've done in the last 20 years was playing my older sister, her son, where he was six at the time, and she arm twisted me into playing for his school assembly. So there were sort of 40 six year olds. And it was just, I was, I had no idea yeah. what they were going to do, you know? Yeah. And, and it was, it was utterly terrifying. I did the wheels on the tour bus go round and round. Why wouldn't you do that, Frank? Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and, they, and they're an unforgiving crowd. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. I've got two granddaughters now who are seven and five. And when they come right. over and to play them a song, you know, I have to I have to either find something on YouTube that I can play along with. Actually, one of the other more nerve wracking shows I had, which you you featured in this story. You know Teenage Cancer Trust, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I've done one of their shows for Roger at the uh, Royal Albert Hall. And as part of the deal, um, I went and did some shows in some of the Teenage Cancer Trust wards, which, again, is it's nerve-wracking because it's an undifferentiated audience. They didn't buy yeah. tickets to see you yeah. play. They're, they're teenagers who are not well. Yeah. In some ways, it's it's a wonderful thing because they're quite often quite vivacious people and all the rest. But I was playing in one of them and, you know, they're all standing there. And there was this 14-year-old girl who didn't give a shit about me. Yeah. She didn't know who I was and she wanted me to know I didn't know who she was. And I finished playing and she came over to me and she said, um, who's the most famous person in your phone? And I was stumped. And I was like, um, Billy Bragg? And she, no. Uh, and I sort of said, uh, Danny Boyle? No. Um, uh, Adam Durich from Cat and Crows? No. And, and just, I couldn't come up with anything that even, the only one that got anywhere was Dan Bastille. Oh, yeah, fair enough, yeah. And she knew, she knew who Dan was, and Dan's an old friend of mine. But um, it was it was quite humbling. Yeah. If young people ever come up and recognise me and say, are you Billy Bragg? I say, yeah. They say, oh, my teacher thinks you're great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, soon it's going to yeah. be, I suppose, it's going to be my granny thinks you're great. Yeah, I've graduated to the point of um, my, my my parents love what you do. Yeah, oh, my, dad, I always, my dad used to play your records. Right. I get a lot of that, which is great. I love that. And I'm always, you know, because I'm normally, you're at the, you know, you often see them people at the gig, which I'm really pleased about when you've been around sure. that, that long, you know. You're doing 20 years, aren't you? Yeah, I'm coming. Well, I was going to talk to you about this. You're doing your Roaring 40, are you not? I'm on 41 now. You're just coming up 20 years solo, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. And uh, in fact, yes, it is 20 years. My first solo show was 20 years ago this year. I mean, and, and your Roaring 40s started when I was two. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Scary, that. Um, <laughs> it's really scary. But this is the thing I spend a lot of time thinking and sometimes writing about is about that, you know, I feel like many ways the paradigms of rock and roll are quite youth oriented, <laughs> to put it yeah. fancily. And, um, you know, what do you do? What do you reach for when you're trying to find ways of sustaining and maintaining interest and creativity and stuff when you reach uh, a non rock and roll age, I suppose, would be a polite way of putting it. Two words for you, Frank, folk music. The thing about the folk music audience is they, they actually encourage you to grow old sure you know what i mean they're really pleased if you've got a gray beard 
they'll have you at the at Cambridge Festival. You know, if if that you know, if Morrissey got grey beard and tubby like me, they wouldn't have him at uh, you know at anywhere. So it's kind of like if you've got <laughs> one foot in that folky thing, and you kind of have because you you do outrageously things like going stage with an acoustic guitar, didn't you? Yes, well, it's been known to happen, yeah. and uh, I, it's a, I have a, I have a little one-liner for it when I'm when we're playing a more kind of punk rock show as we are tonight. You know, you kind of go, "This friends is an acoustic guitar, which is an object that can be used for great good or great evil," uh, and we're going to see, we're going to see how this one goes. Yeah, yeah. I think about this a lot, and about sort of, I mean, you've been releasing records for many, many years, and finding new things to say for many, many years, and you know, I read a thing, um, Nick Cave talking about how every time he makes a record, he feels like he's scraping the back and emptying the cupboard and that was reassuring to me in the sense that I often feel like that and you think you finish a record and you think I'm never going to write another song again as long as I live I have a worse one where I start to make a record and I listen to the one before and think how the fucking hell did I do that and I'm now got to make another one right but the thing is Frank you know with, with folk music it, you're part of a tradition right and and so I'm referencing back to Woody Guthrie who did a lot of the same things that I'm doing he's pretty punk rock Woody yeah, sure. And you're part of a tradition as well. It's a different tradition, but your tradition is punk rock, and that is as folk music. And Woody is older than me, so punk rock and your tradition is older than you. You know, it's a, you're you're reaching back before you were born to be part of something that has great great meaning to you. So in that sense, it, it doesn't matter where you are in the continuum of that tradition, right? Because punk and the punk and folk have so much overlap. Sure, you know, and Skiffle's in there as well. It's ordinary people making music for their own entertainment. And no, no gatekeepers, and no, you know, no editors. Yeah, that's how free folk and punk and skiffle were. Yeah, yeah, I loved your book on skiffle. By the way, it was amazing. You're very kind. Thank you very much. So I think you know you're in that continuum as well, Frank. So if you look at the punks ahead of you, you know the likes. You know, Weller's still out there. Yeah, yeah, he's still doing. You know, I'm sure Joe would be. If Joe was still alive, he'd still be doing gigs. You know. Yeah. And you're part of that. And there's a way to do that, and you just have to come to terms with it. My way of coming to terms with it, which is just to let myself go grey, mm. so that people knew I wasn't that young guy anymore. And now when I started needing glasses, not least to see the dots on my guitar neck, right. I thought, okay, I'm going to go with that. I'm going to wear yeah. glasses. On. This is who I am. And, and embracing the way you stand in it yeah. rather than trying to pretend that you stand somewhere else. And there are benefits. I mean, my voice has got deeper as I've got older. And I, I, yeah. now, you know, I have a, I play two guitars on stage. You've got a, a solid body electric and a Gibson a semi-acoustic 125 and from it's as old as I am. But that guitar is tuned a whole step down. Right, okay. So it's helping get, you know, to sing in a, a lower register. And, and, you know, when I was doing the 40th tour last year, I was actually playing the whole of Life's a Riot, it's only 17 minutes long, as an encore. Yeah, yeah. And I had to do it as an encore because in the proper key, it's a real stretch. For me now, it's a real stretch, you know, apparently, uh, uh, Tam Tab not, New England not so bad, but those, you know, Milkman, they, I really, really have to, you know, get up there to do it. But sure. That, that's because we, you know, we do age. I mean, I mean, that's reflected on your latest record, though, isn't it? Because you're, yeah, you're looking back and reflecting on, on the things that you've done and, and, you know, how you feel about those now. And I think that's not a bad thing to be doing. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that, a real breakthrough moment for me, and again, I'm sorry, but I'm going to blow smoke up your ass for a second here. But like, Hang on, let me bend up. Thank you. There was a, a, a bit of a breakthrough moment for me was like, I remember the first time I heard stuff like, um, I mean, a lot of Loud and Wainwright songwriting, who's a huge, huge influence yeah. on me. But also, yeah. I mean, Tank Part Salute and Brick Bat yeah. and songs like that of yours. Yeah. It was like so much rock and roll stuff is about first kisses and staying awake all night yeah. and dancing on a beach at dawn. And and there was something so revelatory to me to hear people singing songs in a mode that I like and that I enjoyed that were about things like fatherhood or in Loud and Wainwright's case, divorce or whatever. And and it was it was so empowering. It was like, oh, you can also do this. Do you know what I mean? You can write yeah. songs about the thing you can continue to write honestly about the events in your life once yeah. they've graduated beyond <laughs> your early 20s of course but there's no there's no real secret to that Frank. i mean i'm just trying to write what i see now at the time where i am in this moment you know i don't want to be you know going back and and reflecting back on those days all the time i mean one of my one of my you know most well-known songs um between the wars I do play. I just played it. I did a miners' benefit on Saturday night sure. uh, in a tiny village hall in in Kent, and of course I played it there because it fits in that context. Of course. But I, I got a, I got a terrible feeling that some of my audience, when I was singing it in the early two thousands, that some of my audience were feeling nostalgic for the good old days of Margaret Thatcher and yeah. Margaret. I don't really want to be that guy, you know. So I'm, I'm yeah. trying to update things by writing things like "Take Down the Union Jack," which was around that time, you know. And I'm like, yeah. That's a great song between the boys, but check this is where we are now. We're here now. Let's get our, get our heads around this, you know. And and I think 
As I say, I've, I heard that reflected yourself in uh, Undefeated, uh, both in the track itself and also in the whole vibe of the album. Well, thank you. I often find myself in this um, kind of slightly between two stools sort of place in my life. But I mean, both in the sense that like musically, I've never, and again, I think that you and I have this in common, never quite fit into any one given scene. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We both, and I, I love, um, I read there's a Sylvie Simmons book about Leonard Cohen, which is one of my favorite books ever. And it talks about the fact that Leonard Cohen was sort of stood just on the edge of the photo in so many kind of scenes, you know, the Warhol scene, the Greenwich Village scene, whatever, and never quite in the middle. And I, it can be a lonely forehead to plow, but ultimately, I really respect that and for me I was sort of on the edge of the Mumford thing I was on the edge of the kind of gallows punk yeah. thing and the edge of the Libertines yeah. thing and um but also it's like you know I'm at a place in my life now I'm touring with no effects right now who I'm hoping aren't listening in on this next door but like you know that's one generation of punks do you know what I mean yeah, and then there's exactly. there's also there's so many great new punk bands coming through right now younger bands yeah. um uh and and I'm sort of in between those two stools kind of thing and it's just like how how do you find a, a secure footing in that situation the funny thing is those young bands are trying to struggle with the same questions that you and I struggled when we were coming through and they're looking for people ahead of them in the game to say how do I you know I mean never mind me they're looking how do I keep this going as long as Frank Turner sure so I think the hardest the hardest thing to ever do in this job in this in this gig is to get to that position where you can give up your shitty day job and start making a living. Sure. And if you can sustain that more than five years in the music industry, you are really doing well. So many of the people that I was in the first flush of fame admired, looked up to, respected, worked with, were ahead of me in the game, they're gone. Yeah, yeah. They're gone. And I'm, I'm still here. I mean, you know, again, there's something else you talk about on your new record uh, about still being here, you know. But you, 20 years is incredible, Frank, to be able to keep going and still be... Thank you, man. You know not have fallen into any of the obvious traps and done it lightly without relying on having massive hit singles. You know, it's like Wilco, they're the same. I mean, I hugely respect Wilco, obviously because of the work with them. They're massive, but they don't, it's not like they're in the charts every other week. And I think sure. those of us who have feel really strongly about what we do, I think that, you know, we have to find a way to, you know, fuel and, and keep carrying on, even though we don't get embraced by the mainstream. I've never been hip. You know, yeah. I've never been the, groov the, the groovy guy on the front of Mojo. It's never been me. But, you know, shit, I've made a great living. You know, I have a, I have a, yeah. a, a, a lovely life. I can more or, less, more or less choose where I go and play. And when I want to do something, most people are saying, oh, that's great, let's do that. I feel really proud of that. It's a, and it's a huge privilege, of course it is, to yeah. be able to, to and to, as you say, to make a living. Because, I mean, occasionally, like, somebody asked me, like, you know, do you think you're going to sort of take a long break at some point and this kind of thing? And it's like, I mean, this is also how I pay my mortgage. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, yeah. this is also my job. You know, yeah. I'm so lucky to do what I do for a living, and I'm super yeah. aware of that. I was going to say as well, though, like what you're talking about, because in exactly the way that you said, you know, when I was sort of first starting out, and we met a long time ago, and I was yeah. very much kind of taking notes about, like, wow, fucking hell, he's still doing it and and the idea that there are younger bands kind of doing that it, it, you know passing the baton kind of thing is a wonderful thing and one of the things i've always respected about you is the way that you have and i'm but one example of it is kept an eye on newer people younger people coming through i mean there are there are often days to this day where i feel like you are so much more tuned into what's happening on the kind of the the ground floor of the music industry than i am i'm not so sure about that frank well i don't know man i think you underestimate how, how much input my partner julia has on doing <laughs> that field. you know she's much more on top of it than I am. Sure. And I've got Jack as well in my ear, Jack Valero, but, you know, my son, uh, breathing in my ear about stuff. But that just means you've got your spies. All those things always help you. So listen, I want to talk about, I want to talk about 15 gigs in a day. Mm. Yeah, terrible idea. Oh, one of the worst no, ideas. No, no, I was amazed by that. That's really good. No wonder you've done three thousand fucking gigs, mate. If you're doing it, if you're hitting them at that rate, that's incredible. I have to say that because we've got so three thousands on the books, and I, I have therefore got a very precise number of shows I have to play before February twenty second next year. I see that, yeah. And that, and one of the attractions of the fifteen shows in twenty four hours thing was like, well, that's getting my numbers up. It was interesting. In two thousand nine, I actually did twenty four shows in twenty four hours for a music video for the road, but they were all in London, right? And I was in my twenties, uh, yeah. 
And there was also a period in my life where I was powered rather more by chemicals than I am now in my yeah, 40s. Exactly, yeah. Which sort of made it easier while it was happening and then much harder afterwards. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, but no, we got through it on bottled water and donuts. It was all over the place, wasn't it? Up and down the country like a yeah. bloody yo-yo. Well, it was, but it was cool to do and it was all independent venues and you know Mark yeah. had it as well. And everything. That's what was so great about it, I think. It was for a cause as well. That's what's great. Yeah. People often... Uh, you know, associate me and you and what we do in a way because we're both outspoken what we do. But I think the thing that we most have in common is we're, we're both idealists. Sure. You know, we both believe that music should be something more than just, I'm great, you're shit, you like my socks. Yeah. You know, <laughs> paraphrase Oasis. So, you know, that that aspect of what you do and what I do, that's why I, I you know, I have a huge amount of respect for you, Frank, because you walk Thank it you like you talk it in a sense. I have a song which I'm sure you're familiar with, I Still Believe, which has a line about rock and roll can save us all. And there are times when people kind of slightly raise an eyebrow at the, at the oh, perhaps what people might view as the over sincerity of that statement. And the thing for me yeah. about that is that, like, I mean, first of all, there's a degree of tongue in my cheek with that. Do you know I mean, it's a fun line. It's not entirely like po faced. But also, this is the thing, you know, like music has done more for me than words could ever express in every aspect of my life. Everything I know about politics, I learned from listening to records. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, and all yeah. the rest of it. And, you know, I, there is a sense of debt to be repaid almost, I would say, then, man. Do you know what I mean? When you've been fired up by something like punk, you don't forget the reason why you wanted to do this. You know, you don't forget the reason why you wanted to step on stage. You don't forget what, how you felt when you didn't have a voice. Yeah. You don't forget how powerless and angry you felt when no one gave a shit about you. Totally. You know? Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about Young Francis. <laughs> yeah, I did that a little bit on the new record. Uh, you, you know, I've been I've been thinking. It's, I only mention it because I've been thinking a lot about my fifteen year old self recently as well. Because it's this year. It's going to be. Oh, this is a terrible thing to say, Frank. It's fifty years since I left school. Right. Wow. Christ. Yeah. Just you know, thinking back to those days. I recently did a thing on Facebook where I I, I posted a photograph of the inside of the lid of my first box of singles, which is a chronological list of the singles I bought from the first one, which was You Wear It Well by Rod Stewart in 1972. Nice. Through to um, a, a burst of uh, status quo in, in 1970, the first <laughs> box. But it really, putting it out there and, and talking to people about it, really took me back to those those years when I was just a music fan, when I was outside of the actual thing. And, and where was Young Francis in regard to all that? I mean, the the big thing for me is so I got sent away from home when I was eight years old by my folks, which, you know, I'm now at an age where I can have that conversation openly with my folks about that and about their decision making process. But I hated it. It was awful. Yeah. And, and I, I hate to be. I can understand home. it, man. I have a lot of sympathy with you. I have to say for that. A lot of sympathy. Yeah. Eight years old. Eight years old. A big turning point for me was when my sister's son turned eight. I was suddenly just like, oh, hold the phone do you know what i mean like that's too young yeah. um but you know and it's it's this is perhaps a, a little over melodramatic statement but like ro music became my kind of life raft do you know what i mean and lots of my friends got into music through their parents record collection or whatever and that's great but like my parents listened to the psalms and like yeah. birdie do you know what i mean yeah. and like i found iron maiden <laughs> and then later the clash <laughs> um and nirvana and the clash it didn't come to me i sort of slightly stumbled across it randomly and i didn't really even have many friends who liked it either it was yeah. just fucking mine and and that yeah. went, went, meant both then and now i'm hyper defensive of it my parents banned me from buying records and music magazines when i was 11 i got into maiden when i was 10 i bought a copy of Krang magazine that had a feature on cannibal corpse and in a, again in a way that i'm now old enough to understand my mum was just like no, <laughs> like this is not coming into this house. So, um, you know, I had to sneak around and get and, and, and buy records and magazines kind of on the sly. And therefore, my sense of kind of proprietal like ownership of that stuff is very strong. And, and the class, of course, as well, because, you know, it's I hated being a boarding school kid. It's not what I wanted to be. But Joe Strummer was a boarding school kid as well. And Joe yeah. Strummer survived that and became Joe Strummer. And that was exactly. so important to me as a kid to see that and to see there is an option here. There is a route here through yeah. this that doesn't involve ending up working in the city or whatever. Yeah. And, and, and I know that you did as well more contemporaneously. In a different way. I mean, a slightly, obviously I went to a state school. I left when I was 16, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of violence, mate. There was a lot of violence. And what happened was those bullies that were at school, they were in the pubs where you went drinking in town, you know. Sure. So you were just in that situation. So... How do you escape from that? Well, I escaped by sitting in my mum's back room with my mates 
playing music. So right. I, didn't have yeah. to, I, didn't, I didn't have to engage in that world. I, my sense of who I am, my self-realisation came through playing Faces and Stone songs and eventually yeah. Clash in my back room. So music, you know, rock and roll saved me in that sense, you know. Right, uh, completely. In, in the way that it, it, it gave me a place to reinvent myself because when I think of my 15-year-old self, you know, my first name's Stephen, William's my middle name. You know, Stephen Bragg was a... You know, he was a he was a lovely kid, but he just you know he just he had no confidence, and he really couldn't he really couldn't sort of hold his own in a, in a, in a in a group. And but Billy Bragg, through the power of punk, became someone who could ultimately stand on stage on his own in front of a thousand people. In front of thousands of people. Yeah, I could never have done that without my mates. And I know you and you the band, of course, as well in the same way. But those guys I went to school with, I still see them. You know, sitting around dreaming with them dreaming about being in a band, dreaming about touring America. When I finally got to tour America, I rang the guy who li- lived next door, took me out to play guitar, Wiggy. I said, Wiggs, come on, you've got to come. You've got to be my roadie because this might be the only time I ever go to America. You've got to come with me or it will be only half meaningful. If you come with me, the two of us together. And eventually we got to, we, we were opening for Echo and the Bunnymen. It took about six weeks to drive across America. We went to places, some places I've never been to again, like Salt Lake City, amazing tour it was. But at the end of it, the Bunnymen went home. We had a couple more days. And we, um, we rented a car and we drove to the end of Route 66, which is Sun- uh, Sunset Boulevard. And we yeah, went yeah. to the Pacific and we paddled in the Pacific Ocean and we toured America coast to coast. And I'll be honest with yeah. you, we had, we had a bit of a, I had a bit of sand in my eye at that moment because we'd really, really achieved. Uh, and there was a, just that little moment there where we kind of reconnected with our 15-year-old selves. And there was a lovely thought. Which is important, Yeah. Yeah, and we come off the beach in, after this emotional moment, and there was a British pub there in Santa Monica. <laughs> pub, and we went there to have a pint, and they fucking wouldn't let us in because we didn't have ID. But <laughs> it was still that moment of, a, of connection with our 15-year-old selves. Yeah, 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 sure. You know, that's really important to, I think, in terms of your development. So it was good to you, it was good to you declaring a ceasefire with Young Francis on your record. Yeah, right, totally. And, and like, and I mean, because the, the, that's the thing, that song in particular, like, for me, you know, the flip side of all of this, like, I'm, I'm quite sort of, I almost want to say protective of my hypothetical teenage self because the thing was when I was a teenager, the world was black and white. I was angry and I knew the answer because I was 15. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, everyone do what I say and it's all solved. I was very, very into my kind of, I was into like crass and discharge and that sort of side of things and and very sort of hyper militant about DIY and all that sort of thing as well. And a, a big part of where that song came from, like on my previous record, we got the the number one in the UK charts, which, you know, which was great, and, and it's, but it's one of those things, it didn't fall out of the sky, do you know what I mean? There was a big campaign yeah. around it, and we worked really hard, and I was, and 40-year-old me was very proud of that, and that was a thing Why that I sound set out to achieve. Uh, but the, literally the minute that I got the phone call saying that you've got the number one, the 15-year-old me who lives in the corner of my head just went, fucking sell out. Because when I was a kid, my self-definition was I didn't care about or like music in the charts because yeah. my art was outsider art. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I grew up in the midst of Britpop and it was Blur versus yeah. Oasis. And I made, I went yeah. home, this is true, and I homemade a T-shirt that said shit pop and, uh, and I wore it to school and I got beaten up. More power to you, Frank. Yeah, the charts were for other people. They weren't for me. And then suddenly I found myself in them. And, I, and I, there is a tension there, you know, between those that youthful idealism. Imagine how Penny Rimbo felt when he saw you at number one, Frank. He must have shook his head. And looked- <laughs> <laughs> well, I found I found a photo of me wearing a crass T-shirt the other day when I was fifteen. I put it on the internet, and uh, and I had like white hair, like I, you know, you buy bleach from yeah. Boots, and yeah, yeah. it says yeah. don't leave it on for more than an hour. So you put it on for twelve hours because uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, I just wanted to be Johnny Rotten. I mean, the thing is, we're all bored ignorant, aren't we? Mm. And hopefully, the the wisdom. Uh, and the experiences that we have bring us to a better place rather than a worse place. It doesn't happen for everybody. There's still issues that I'm trying to get my head around. Right, and I feel that one of the one of the defining characteristics of getting older for me is a sense of an increasing sense of how little I know. Do you know what I mean? Like because yeah. you 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 get older and you're curious about the world and you read wider and you talk to people and you try and investigate things that you don't understand and suddenly you go oh my god I just feel like you just like lifted up a floor tile and there was a yeah. thousand foot drop under it do you know what I mean yeah. and that's that's everywhere and 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 like I think that's a good thing I think a sense of kind of intellectual humility is a useful thing to yeah. just sort of say about the world I I'm, I don't really know actually yeah. you know that's not to say I'm not going to have opinions and I'm not going to try no, and no. Um, say what I feel and 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 all 
alter the world in or, or you know push the world in ways that I think are, are worthwhile. But but doing it with the humility that you didn't have when you were fifteen, I think, is important. But I think also being older helps you also to make connections with new ideas, with things that you experienced back in the day. For instance, you know my experience. Uh, with regard to the uh, boycotts of South Africa in the 1980s, mm. apartheid. Sure. Now it's becoming relevant again with regard to Israel sure. and the Gaza conflict. All those things, sure. you know, talking to younger people about it. Yeah, I mean, we did manage to make a contribution with the cultural boycott. Likewise, yeah. the treatment of uh, transgender and non-binary people now. I was going to bring that up because I've heard you do sexuality with the new words that you do. Yeah, a little tweak. It's a little tweak, but it's important. Of course, but it, but it's a, but it's a very important gesture. And I know trans people who have been moved by that. So, yeah. you know, it, it's working. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> what can I is, say? The thing is, Frank, if I didn't, if I didn't recognise that, if I didn't have a, a, you know, a sense of support for trans community i don't think i'd have the right to sing sexuality anymore frankly i think people would say a they would say it's not very not very radical going for a beer with a with a gay man is it in 2024 one old geezer but more importantly hey you're sitting on the fence about this issue you're out you know so for me sure it's a way of staying true to my 25 year old self late 20 self you know and i think if you have the opportunity to do that rather than i mean we all get cynical of course we all get cynical but we are you and i we're in a lucky position, and when we get cynical, we can write about it, go out there in the dark with everyone, see them respond in a positive way and think to ourselves, well, we're we're not alone how we feel about this. And that, I don't know about what it does for you, but it really charges my sense Absolutely. of activism up and <clears throat> kicks my, 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 my cynicism right in the ghoulies. Sure. It also, but this this also plays to what I was saying about, about um, humility and stuff as well, because, you know, for, on a very personal level for me, you know, uh, I, the, I feel like the, the whole transgender debate has been kind of revealed, as it were, by the internet, because more people from all over the world can make connections yeah. who are in isolated situations. And I remember sort of coming across it in, I don't know, 2013 or something and just sort of yeah. going I don't know and then yeah. uh, um, Laura Jane Grace the singer from Against Me who was a friend of mine who I knew before she came out she came out and that was like interesting and then we hung out after she came out and it was like this is the same person because of yeah. course it is um, and that was quite opening for me and then my father came out as transgender and I do still use the word father that's that's <laughs> that's been been okayed yeah. as it that's were, right. um, yeah. but but I mean you know the, the, my central feeling when all of that sort of debate comes up is that like you know I am a straight white I think cis is the term man and and I'm there is no part of me that's going to stand anywhere and say I know what it's like to be trans that would be a ridiculous yeah. thing for me to say no. but the next step of this thinking for me is to say like well I know some people who do know what it's like to yeah. be trans so why don't we fucking listen to them yeah. because. <laughs> They're exactly. the people living through this, but there's that, that. There is that. Yeah, there is that sense of like maybe I'm not the person who needs to be leading this conversation. You can be yeah. an ally. You can you yeah. can assist and all the rest of it. But it's like you know I don't need to necessarily be the person thumping the table, standing no, uh, no, that's the true. stage. I mean, I, I, maybe if I didn't have sexuality in the center of my set, I wouldn't do that myself. But I think the trans community oh, yeah, have yeah. Asked, or cis cis allies to to speak up, and I think it does I, particularly, absolutely, particularly for my generation, because I think my generation find it really hard. This one, you know, they're always complaining about oh, you know, pronouns. I get pronouns wrong all the time. Oh, totally. The thing is to recognise it and say, oh, so I'm so sorry, and correct yourself. It's when you don't correct yourself, or when you do it deliberately in a provocative way, that's a problem. So I do have to say, I have to say to my audience, a, a lot of them who are in my generation, you know, particularly the guys. <laughs> Never going to have to. You're never going to be as hip as we were back then. Oh, yeah. there's, there's no reason. It's gone. It's gone, mate. It doesn't matter how many copies of the NME you got in your bedroom wardrobe. It's gone. You get it. <laughs> but there's no reason why you shouldn't be as relevant and as active. There's no excuse for that. If you are, if you are giving up, it's uh, it's um, you, you know, think of your 20 year old self. You know, is there? You know, there must uh, a, a spark in moment. It's an interesting question, Frank. You and you and young Francis. Was there a moment? Or, or an event that turned the world so you became Frank Turner and you ceased to be in Francis Turner? Was there an emotional, a musical, political? I mean, for I me, mean, it was rock against racism for me, where I became yeah, 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 really sure. glad that people understand. If I go right back and think back all the way back to where did that start, the rev there was a revelatory experience for me. To, yeah, yeah. It was my first political experience. And not only sure. did I see... Or, you know, 80,000 kids just like me at that event um, to see the Clash play, Steel Pulse, Tom Robinson, X-Ray Specs. But also an interesting thing that, that just happened to 
me at that event, or me and my mates anyway, was when Tom sang Sing If You're Glad To Be Gay, a lot of the guys around us started kissing each other. And I'd, you know, I was 19, but I'd never met an out gay man. I'm sure I'd met a gay man, but I'd never met an out gay man. And that experience made me realise that afternoon that, that our generation were going to define themselves in opposition to discrimination of all kinds, not just racism, sure, but, sure. but homophobia, sexism. We were going to be the generation of two-tone, rock against racism. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Gonna, You know, that was going to, uh, uh, artists against apartheid. And that experience, that, you know, when people say to me, why do you keep banging on about the trans bill? It's because of those guys, those brave gay men. I mean, I'm 78, but you get your head kicked in yeah. if people thought you were gay. Those brave men feeling that in that context they could be out for a moment, they could be themselves because because we'd marched in under this great big banner that said "Gays for against the Nazis," you know. So that's how how it happened. So that that was my I suppose my moment where the whole Billy Bragg thing can be traced back to. Do you have a moment like that? There's a couple that spring to mind. I mean, I remember going to um, I went to Reading Festival '95 with a friend. My best mate's dad was taking her and agreed to take me as well. So it got the okay from my mum. And I was 13, I yeah. um, which was great. And and uh, I, you know, this is a point in my life where I would wear Nirvana t-shirts, maybe Green Day t-shirts, stuff like this. And I didn't really know anybody else who did, right? And right. I remember walking into Reading Festival and meeting 60,000 people wearing band t-shirts and wow. going, fuck, here's yeah. my tribe. These are my yeah. people. Do you That's know what I mean? It. And like yeah. that, that realization, but I mean, there were, there were, there were other ones like that. Um, there's a, you may not know them. There's a hardcore punk band called Agnostic Front from New York. And that was I the don't first. Know, but... they, they've been going since the early eighties. They're still going now. Uh, great band. Yeah. But I went to see them. I, I can tell you it was the uh, 8th of December, 1997, because I've got it in mind for these things. I saw them play at the garage in London and oh, like, yeah. I'd sort of got on from like Green Day and Offspring and Nirvana and stuff and started listening to Black Flag and Dead Kennedys and Minor yeah. Threat and that sort of territory stuff. And um, I went down to this show at the garage and it was in the winter and it was dark and I was first in the queue because I got there stupidly early because I was, I was there kind of on the lam, as it were. Yeah. And, um, and like one by one, these people came out of the tube station or off from the bus stop or walking down the Holloway Road wearing, again, band T-shirts that I knew, but like really obscure band T-shirts, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. Like Strife and all this kind of thing. And it was like punk rock suddenly wasn't a thing I was reading about in books anymore. It was like, it's happening now. You know, so many people told me, and there's a song on my new record about this, so many people told me when I was a kid and I was getting buying crass records, discharge records, well, punk's dead, punk's over. There's no, yeah. and, and, and I didn't know anyone who was doing that kind of underground punk now. And then I found them and they were there and there was a vibrant scene and there's a guy called Lil, who ran a record label called Household Name that was the, the UK hardcore label in the 90s. I don't yeah. remember this, but he does. Apparently, at that show, he had a distro, do you know what I mean? A suitcase full of CDs yeah. and seven inches and stuff. And apparently, I went up to him and I said, I've got 10 pounds and I want to buy some hardcore. Um, <laughs> And he uh, he took this part. This part is definitely true. He took my address. He told me. To, he told me. He said, "Keep your fucking money." He took yeah. my address and he sent me mixtapes. Oh, far out! Great. That is so great. And actually, the next part of this story, it was the day before you and I played at Wembley in 2012. What a day, what a day that was! Which was a lovely day. I was it walking was. down Camden High Street and I ran into Lil. Right, and it, this was by this point in my life. Quite a lot of people who I knew from the hardcore scene in the 90s had decided I was a bit kind of de trop because I was too successful or whatever, do you know what I mean? And a bit a bit non-you or whatever. Lil never did that. I ran into him. I said, oh, man, are you coming to the show tomorrow? He said, oh, where are you playing? And I said, Wembley. And he said, oh, you know, the dog and pheasant or whatever, you know. And I was like, no, the fucking arena. And he yeah. laughed and he said, there's no way that you're playing Wembley Arena. And I love the fact he didn't know about it, incidentally. Great, yeah. So I put him on the guest list. I gave him like, you know, best seats in the house that I could get him and everything. And he sent me a text after the show that just said seven out of 10. <laughs> uh, you want God that though, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, totally. It was a bit of grounding. But doesn't that come down then, Frank, to what the power of music? You know, maybe you don't feel it so much because you're younger, but it was always during punk, there was a... Um, a kind of leftover idea from the 60s that music could change the world. And The Clash certainly sure. promoted itself as doing that. And I kind of bought into that as a Clash fan. <laughs> but in my own experience, it's not true. Music has no, uh, it doesn't have any uh, you know, real kind of agency to be able to change. 
But hold on, hold on. Right. Now I'm going to tell you about my experience with this and I'm going to disagree with you in a specific way, right? Because <laughs> by the time I was going to punk shows and stuff, yeah, punk was very much, it was a subculture. It had no ambitions or pretensions to being culture wide. Yeah. There was no sense that this little group of people is going to affect everybody. Um, yeah. And in many ways, the hardcore scene that I got into from that agnostic front show onwards, I've got my UK HC tattoo right there, um, was, was, was very... Uh, it was like, I think of it as almost like a school playground kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? So there was a lot of talk about animal rights, about anti-capitalism, about women's rights, about gay rights, all that kind of thing. Um, and it was done in this slight, in this kind of safe, spacey kind of way. Do you know what I mean? I mean, and yeah, there, yeah. there were times when it was slightly ludicrous because you'd have a room full of boys sitting around discussing how to get more girls to come to hardcore shows. And it was just a bit like, ah, not sure about oh, the option. Isn't that part of why we joined, apply for this job in the first <laughs> That and the fact we right. don't have to get up in the morning. So that's, that were the two big attractions for me. Yes, exactly. But like, so, so, um, uh, but so there's all that going on. And, 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 and of course, the idea, you know, occasionally to this day, you run into people who are under the impression that Bob Dylan like caused the civil rights movement or something. And you're just like, you're out of your fucking mind. That's not the historiography of that event. But here's the thing. And this goes to what we were talking about earlier. Punk rock and my experience of it, even as a very self-consciously isolated outsider art form, it changed me. It may not have changed the world, but it changed me. And it changed my interaction with the world. And it made me understand that things like women's rights, animal rights, gay rights, whatever it might be, um, were important. And, and, you know, there were, and this is a thing that I do to this day, like for myself in terms of my activism, I quite specifically choose charities that are music adjacent. So for example, I work with Able to UK, who are a group who do disabled access to music venues is their big thing, right? Now, obviously, music venues aren't the most important thing in the whole world. And that disabled access is an issue that spreads way beyond those boundaries. But there are two things about that. First of all, talking about music venues, I feel like I'm on safe ground. I know what I'm talking about. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not going to overstep my bounds and say something okay. that I don't really know what I'm talking about. But secondly, what I'm hoping in the same way, in the exact same way that the hardcore scene worked for me as a kid where it was like we're talking about all this now now you're going to go home and you're going to take these ideas and take these lessons and take these ethics and these principles and apply them in your civilian life for want of a better term yeah, yeah. um you know when people come to my shows and they see safe gigs for women or able to uk or um stay up late do you know stay up late a brilliant charity no. to get people with they do people with learning disabilities they get them gig buddies so that they can come to shows and they set up a thing for that which is fantastic do you know what i mean that is brilliant and there's loads of others as well and, and indeed i work with the ally coalition in the states who are an lgbtq plus organization yeah. that again is music centered but th the implication is look we've made this work in this room for this two yeah. hours three hours whatever how about if it went beyond this room? And now it's on you. That's what you say to the audience. That doesn't mean it's not also on me, but it's now it's on all of us, not just on me. I'm 100% with that. It's the same conclusion that I've came to, that music cannot change the world. Trust me, I've been trying for 40 years to see if it will. But what <laughs> it can do, and the thing that you've just described in, in all of those uh, 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 initiatives, what music can do is it can make you believe the world can be changed. I mean, this is a good example for, for me for talking about uh, trans rights on stage and why we need to support them, right? There will be quite a few people in my audience of my age who haven't really thought about this, right? And they're not, they're not against trans, they're not pro-trans or nothing. They, really, they just thought, it's nothing to do with me. Sure. But they stand in my audience and they hear the way the majority of them respond to what I'm saying and they think to themselves, well, I'm I'm in line with all the other things that everybody in this audience is into, the trade union yeah. rights, you know, ch chain rules, stop the war in Gaza. Maybe I should really get my head around this as well. And it's that aspect that you've just talked about. Sure. You know, it's just yeah. the, the, yeah, yeah. disability access. I've not really thought about this before. Maybe I should think about it. And that, Changing that attitudes. aspect of it, that music can, can, you know, make you believe the world can be changed to take that away and do it. Because if there's any change, it undoubtedly yeah. comes from in the audience, not from where we're standing. Exactly. You know, it's, we reflect that. But, but also I think there's a, another really important thing that's, that's kind of feeds into this, and that is that feeling that you got when you saw that there were other people into what you were into at the garage waiting to see a band I had heard of from New York, or when, <laughs> you to, when you went to Reading, or when I went to Rock Against Racism and saw 800 kids like me and felt, you know, I'm not the only one who gives a shit about this. And that's how yes. I want the audience to go home every night, because I often end with this power in the union. And a good yeah, yeah. number of people put their fists in the air. And, you know, those there may be people who they might perhaps – you know, work or live or go to school in an environment where their views aren't reflected or respected. Sure. But they can take away some of the solidarity in that room. Yeah, that safe space. Into themselves that, that you know, I, I, 
I'm not, you know, there's a room full of people in my town who do give a shit about this. I'm not alone. And the important yeah. thing about this, I think, is also to imagine it doesn't just work for us. It works for all music. I would argue yes. that the yeah, yeah. of music is empathy. A hundred percent. It's about getting you feel, to feel something, some emotion for someone else who you aren't, you know, a person, you know, in a love song, you're listening to a love song. I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've read of recently about Adele getting divorced before her last album. It's about that. If you've been through something like that, if you've got a, an Adele song and it sings somehow to, you has been reading your mail, you know, and you, you're like flipping neck, you go and see her. She's singing the song, the person who revealed this to her, you're singing it, and whatever, 10,000 other people are singing, whatever emotion you've invested in that song is, uh, you feel like it's accepted. Right. You know, you can't you can't get that shit online, Frank. You can't get it. It's a form of communion, brother. Church, football, uh, rock and roll, you know, that people <laughs> coming together to sing together. It's perhaps more important than people coming together to talk together. It's a very, very powerful human thing. <laughs> also, as a brief side to this, I, you know, I've always believed, and I still do believe, that like um, the ownership of interpretation is an in individual. You know, so like yeah. you write a song about this. If somebody takes it to be about something else, that's entirely their right and and good for them. Um, and like I've had some weird. Ins- There's a guy in Germany who's got a cork board, and he's convinced that every song I've ever written is sort of basically about the same thing, and he's got bits of string attaching names to each other and blah 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 and he, he showed me a photo and asked if he was on the right track and i told him he was even even though i was just like, to shut him up well no just i was interested to see where he goes with it do you know what i mean it's like maybe he's right I don't yeah, know. I suppose so. but uh the one that i always have i have a song one of the biggest songs i put out it's called the way i tend to be and it's this breakup song it's a song about me yeah. but essentially realizing that i screwed the pooch with a relationship that i should have held on to and blah 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 incidentally that's now in the past and i love my wife um but <laughs> but um but uh the number of people i've met who've had that song at their wedding and i'm yeah. just like there's a part of me that's like, not that one. <laughs> that's that's a breakup song. Don't uh, no, I, I worry one. about that. The songs that people choose for their first start. Must I paint you a picture? Someone told me they were dancing to that. I'm like, that's a dreadful song to. Yeah. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a lovely one uh, uh, called the 14th of February, which is about mm. meeting Juliet the first time and not being able to remember that the first time we met each other. And we're not realising that we were going to spend, you know, we met in a different situation. It's a beautiful song. Yeah, thank you. And a lot of people, that must be a common experience because a lot, that's the most common Billy Bragg wedding song. Uh, the fact, I think it helps it's the walls. I think that really, really helps. Yeah. Well, listen, mate. Man, it's a, such a pleasure to chat with you. I think we have chatted for a while. <laughs> no, I've are you, are you at Glasgow this year or are you... I will be at Glasgow. I was going to mention this to you, and look, we can do this actually on an interview. Um, I'm at Glasgow for the whole... My wife's never been to Glastonbury before. And oh, cool. she she's like, I'm I'm not big on camping these days, I'll be honest oh, with you. Yeah, yeah. And enough. she's told me to get over myself. And so we're going down. We're, we're camping at Stromerville, and we're doing yeah. the whole weekend. And I'm playing Stromerville on the Thursday, and I'm doing Greenpeace and Avalon on the Friday. But I'll be around, so I'll swing by. Come down and come see us at left field. We'll all be down here. It's great bands on the clock. English teacher. Have you got Grace Petrie playing? No, as well? I think she's up at. Uh, she's at um, the acoustic stage. Um, you, you know, I just did her. I just produced her newest album, actually. Which oh, was, did you? Yeah, yeah. Which um, awesome. and, and I'll, I'll take no credit. She's such an incredible songwriter. She's got a song about um, abortion rights in the states called "Meanwhile in Texas" that was an absolute. This actually goes to what we were chatting about earlier. That is a subject that I obviously have strong feelings about and care about. I'm not sure that I should be the person necessarily leading that conversation. Oh. You, you be an ally and all the rest. Yeah. But it felt so good to me to sit in the producer's chair whilst Grace sung that song. Exactly. And it was just yeah. like, I have played a part in bringing this song to the yeah. public. And if anybody's listening to this, they should check out that song, Me Well in Texas by Grace Petrie. Anyway. I think we should never, those of us who do this job, should never think of ourselves as leading anything. I think the, the, the most we can aspire to do is to join the dots for people to make sure. connections between things and offer a perspective that they might not have seen reflected in in the in the mainstream yeah. uh, media. I mean, I think that's the the justification for making any kind of art is to offer, sure. you know, whatever it is you're creating, is to offer something that has a perspective that isn't already out there. And I think that's, sure. a, you know, that's something we can, without ramming it down people's throats, without telling people we're changing the world, without saying, follow me to the barricades or any of that shit, but just... You know, join in the dots and let people make their own mind. Yeah, out. yeah. So, you know, we all see the same stars. We all see the same, you know, arena. It's how you make those, join those dots for people that makes a difference. Sure. And my politics have changed over the years from being ideological in the 80s when ideology was the framework 
in which we use to discuss things, to be much more now about, you know, I find myself talking a lot more about empathy, talking about, you know, if about you know, if, I had, if I had something on my guitar, like Woody had on his guitar, it would say death to cynicism. You know, it wouldn't sure. be a political yeah, yeah. slogan. It would be much yeah. more humanistic. You know, my, yeah. I define my politics now as progressive rather than socialist. I'm not sure, sure. exactly what socialism means in its context anymore but progressive just touches a lot of touches a lot more base absolutely you know what did, to finish off i had a wonderful thing a few years ago my missus um was in a play that was about mental health and um stephen fry came down and did a talk after one of the performances about mental health and this was at a point in my life when i was on a bit of a low swing in terms of my everything we were talking about how much can music change the world how important is what we do and i was feeling a bit like yeah whatever about the whole thing and stephen fry gave this incredible talk where he talked about how in the 80s people like elton john and freddie mercury and indeed he was too humble to say it but himself by being publicly gay helped change the conversation because people who hadn't thought about that much or possibly even had negative feelings about it but who were huge queen fans would go oh hold on a minute, do you know what I mean? And it's like, it's that leading by example thing. And in that context, we were talking about mental health and, you know, and about how the role of public figures in discussing mental health is to normalize the conversation, destigmatize the conversation. Yep. But I came away from that event with Stephen, who's a very nice man, um, feeling much, much more fired up about the potential for difference yeah. to be made. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, that was a wonderful sure. thing. You've always got to trust the public, haven't you? You've got to trust them that they're going to pick up on what you're saying. They're listening to your sure. records. They're cheering your songs. They they are there just for the joy of entertainment. They are there just for the communion of being in a crowd like that. But they're also there to to take something away. Or maybe sometimes if you chat with them to offer you another perspective on mm, mm. the way things are. You know, I went, first went to America during the minor strike. So I was telling kids over there what was happening in the UK. And they were telling me shit about what was happening in America, which yeah, I was yeah. then back to the UK to tell the UK sure. audience. About yeah, what yeah, was yeah, totally. And that role, yeah. that's what Woody's, Woody's job. You know, that's Woody's work. We all do a bit of that. Yeah. But in the You're end, the, mate, the, the Bush Telegraph. Believe, yeah. You've got to yeah. believe that they still believe because they're yeah. still coming to your gigs. They're still getting fired out by what you're saying. And, you know, they're, they're still – that communion that we talk about is still there. I mean, and, and it would be anyway. And you know as well as I do that we both do this, even if we didn't get paid for it. We'd still be somewhere standing up, playing our songs, getting our, uh, our, our perspective out there. Don't tell management. Because we feel <laughs> that there's something missing in the, in the conversation, you know. And uh, though maybe if we were younger, we'd be more blogging or writing books or whatever. But the fact that music was the social medium of our, our teens, our youth, means that we're still fully engaged in that process. And although it, it no longer has that vanguard role in youth culture, it still has a role to play. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, well, also, you, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, like the, I think one of the interesting lessons of the pandemic, and let's not spend too long talking about that for, if we can avoid it, but like, yeah. you know, there's a lot that you can do on the internet from your house, but very much not everything, you know what I mean? No. And there is that moment when you're in a room full of people that is nothing, that a Zoom call is never going to touch. That goes back to the communion thing. People need to be in the dark together, 100 people together, experiencing yeah. the songs together that, to get yeah. that. You on stage to get that feeling as well, though, Frank, because you know as well as totally. I Totally. We could play these songs as just as loud in our hotel room and not get that that fired up yeah, yeah, yeah. from the songs. It's not in the songs. It's not in us. It's in the communion. Exactly. It's in the energy that comes back. And it is such a privilege to be the person who who facilitates that by standing on the raised up bit of flooring. But, yeah, yeah. you know, hopefully as you do it, you have some humility about it. Yeah. Anyway, right. I feel like we've put the world to rights. I think we have. Yeah. It's been good fun, mate. Bill, thank you for this. It's been such a good time. It's really, really nice to catch up, man. Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast. And thanks to Frank Turner and Billy Bragg for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please follow TalkHouse on your favorite podcasting platform and check out all the great stuff at TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.